Welcome back to the channel. This is JFL. Today we're going to do some questions and answers. All you're going to need today is your notebook and your handy dandy pen. Let's get started. Remember to always smash that like button. Definitely subscribe and always share this with your buddies so we can bring you these great boat builds. Thanks, guys. Welcome to the JFL boat build series. Uh, today's a little different. We've had two weeks straight of uh, Alabama storms. Um, today is clear, but cold, and the boat is totally soaked. So anyway, uh, like I said last week, we're going to go over some questions and answers. Uh, I've written them down in a notebook, so forgive me for looking down, but uh, I've got a lot to cover today. Um, so uh, did everyone else get flooded? Because uh, we sure did. But anyway... Uh, using this as a backdrop today, the rest of the shop is really dirty. We've been working on the boat build stuff. We've been working on glide baits nonstop. If you've seen my bench right now, I would be cursed. But anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to cover some questions and answers. You guys did really good on the questions and answers. Absolutely have answers to every single question that was asked. Um, we're going to get to, I think we had 13 questions total. So we're going to get right on it. First, let's cover... Don't be intimidated by fiberglass gel coat, fiberglass flake, anything that has to do with fiberglass, we're gonna cover it all. And not only are we gonna cover it today, but we're also going to show you in future episodes of the JFL Boat Build Series, we're also gonna show you how to execute certain projects to not only save you time, but also not waste product. Because let's face it, a gallon of resin right now is between $59 and $69 a gallon. Used to be 20 bucks. Three years ago, it used to be 20 bucks. Uh, let's get right into it. It is the easiest material to work with. Yes, it's messy. Yes, when you sand it or grind it or handle it with your bare hands or your bare skin, you get irritant. Uh, wear long sleeves. Uh, not this shirt, but wear a long sleeve shirt. Wear some nitrile, black nitrile, blue nitrile. They have all different colors of nitrile gloves. Uh, wear the gloves. Uh, always wear your dust mask. Uh, make sure it's snug around the bridge of your nose. And uh, also wear eye protection because when you're grinding or even when you're in a fiberglass dusty area, you're going to want to make sure that you have eye protection. The last thing you want is little shards of glass in your eyes uh, that almost can't be seen even by uh, an eye doctor. So you want to make sure that you try to get some eye protection, make sure you have a dust mask. Uh, the last thing you want is glass in your lungs and glass in your eyes. Okay, the next thing is you get very fast results with fiberglass, okay? Uh, the great thing about fiberglass is you can build a plug. Building a plug, this is something simple. Um, you know, everyone has the trolling motor recessed down into the floor of the boat. We're gonna do that with the 21 foot Viper. So what I've done is I've made a plug, okay? This plug that I'm gonna show you right now, okay, this is a plug, all right? So this is going to be basically a mold for a mold. And what I mean by that is this isn't the final plug. This is uh, a fill-in plug. So I'm going to make a mold of this and then I'm going to take that mold and make a mold of the plug. That plug will be reinforced, smoothed out, the bodywork will be perfect because I'm going to start offering these to people for uh, $99. So these will be fiberglass. Uh, so you don't have to put aluminum or metal on the front of your boat. I know they're powder coated and things, but uh, we made this plug and this will be recessed. This is, a, this is the opposite of what you're gonna get. The one you're gonna get is gonna look more like hollowed out. This is the inside of that piece. So this is what you call plug. Now I just made this with cutting board material and some tape and some primer. Um, like I said, this will get covered over with fiberglass and then once we pop this out of that mold, we will smooth that mold off and then we will make a real plug to produce, mass produce these. Um, and then you can buy them on justfishlures.com for 99 bucks. And then when you uh, go to do the carpet or the sea deck in your boat, you're gonna want to fiberglass this in, which is very simple. And by the end of this 
boat build series of number one, the 21 foot boat, you're gonna be a professional at fiberglassing, even this fiberglass tub that you can order through me. Um, and this will be a JFL accessory that you can purchase um, on the justfishfillers.com site. So excited, very simple. I made this out of hot glue gun, popsicle sticks, and uh, really thin cutting board material. And then just went over the top of it with packing tape and that gives you a good solid plug. And then you can fiberglass right over this to make a mold for your new plug that's gonna be the plug that will mass produce uh, thousands of these things. Once you are comfortable and once you master fiberglass, the possibilities are endless. Um, I know friends of mine and myself, we've made entire car bodies um, out of fiberglass. Like I said, we're making the recessed um, pan for the trolling motor pedals. So uh, fiberglass is very, very, very satisfying and the results are very quick. You can usually, by the time you get your plug made, you can have a product within 10 hours from start to finish. That's laying the wax inside the plug, then you're gonna lay your clear coats or flakes if you want it to match your boat, and then you're gonna lay your gel coat, backing, usually a background color, whatever the stages were of your bass boat. Um, a lot of you can order the flake and the gel coat from your manufacturer to get that pan perfect. I can order that stuff, you can send it to me, and we can make sure that pan matches the boat exact. And then uh, once you get that fiberglass in, then you're gonna run your brand new carpet right up to the edge. So when your trolling motor pedal is mounted down in there, the actual metal flake will match your boat. Okay, that's something that people aren't doing right now. We will offer that. It'll be a lot more expensive than $99. I think a metal flake matched pan's gonna run two to 300 bucks if I have to order the flake and gel coats from the manufacturer. If it's not available, the flake's not available, the gel coat's not available, all we can do is get it close. So a metal flake matched uh, pan will run $300 if I have to get the flake and gel coat. Um, if you bring me the flake and gel coat, that pan will run $200. And then if we just do it a standard white, black, or gray, that pan will run $99. Okay, so once you master fiberglass, you're gonna see a whole new uh, situation. Okay, so without further ado, let's go to the questions and answers. And everybody did a really cool job. This is the JFL Boat Build Series questions and answers for episode five. Uh, the number one question that came across five or six times is, how long have you been doing fiberglass gel coat boat repair? Uh, the answer is I started in 1992. Back then I was working on a skateboard. And then shortly after that, I got an RC model car and it was like three feet long. It was a really big, um, it was a, what I call a dual haul. It looked like an eliminator dual haul. It looked like an offshore racing boat. And it was built out of really thin fiberglass sheeting. And somebody had homemade it, but I bought it at a yard sale for like $3. My dad owned a body shop. We were always in the body shop. I brought that thing home and my dad's like, what are you doing with that piece of junk? And I said, well, I want to fix it so I can build an RC. I want to build the boat. So it's like, okay, well, I'll show you how to mix the resin, but you know, be careful, don't get it all over the place. So anyway, I did this, I made a mess is what I did because in 1992, I was 16 going on 17 years old. So when I made the boat, I learned how not to mix resin. I also learned what not to use as far as mesh, as far as uh, fiberglass matting. Chop strand wasn't a thing. You chopped up your own matting and then you made your own chop strand. But the boat ended up weighing about 50 pounds of resin and it would never float. <laughs> so I couldn't even put the accessories on it. But that's where I got my start. Shortly after that, I started doing small fiberglass stuff, like ground effects. Back then, mini trucks were really popular. So I would fix a roll pan. I would fix a side skirt on a mini truck, side scoops, hood scoops. And so started from there. And then my dad at that time was licensed through Stratos Boats to do the transoms. And back then he was taking the whole cap off the boats and then he was repairing the transoms with a like a wafer board that would absorb resin so we would take the wood out and then he would replace it with this honeycomb looking material it was it would come in uh, half inch sheets and then it would absorb the resin so you had 
before like an inch and a quarter to inch and a half of wood transom, um, he would fill it in with this honeycomb uh, type material and then you would fill the cavity with resin and then that thing would just be solid and it would never ever ever rot again because it's solid resin and solid honeycomb and uh, those were mashed together. Uh, but that's probably where I learned the most is watching my dad um, do that stuff and uh, the labor of taking a cap off a boat sometimes is impossible. Um, the Viper boat, the foam is sprayed in there after they seal the cap to the floor. So if we were to take the cap off the Cobra, we would have to cut around the edge of the floor and then we would probably at some point have to pry or we'd, we'd end up ruining the cap of the Viper. So the Viper boat, unfortunately, will not have the cap pulled. Uh, the good thing is the back of the Viper is shaped in a way to where we can uh, cut out the splash well. And even if we had to go sideways a little bit over on top, we're redoing that top black stripe anyway. So even if we have to cut the top of the cap off in the rear of the boat and then repair it later, that's gonna be fine because like I said, we're redoing the whole top cap with flake and gel coat and clear gel coat. So that's uh, exactly where I got my start and how things have come to today. Okay, so second question is, are you considered a professional boat builder? No, uh, this is something that I've done for many years um, and it depends on what you consider a professional. Do I know how to do it the right way? Yes. Do I know how to do it so it won't fail again? Absolutely. But a professional to me is somebody who's licensed or somebody who has been doing this for multiple years. Even though I've done boats for multiple years, it, I don't do it every week for work. To me, a professional is somebody who does the fiberglass work every single day and that's their job. That's not my job, it's my hobby. Uh, during the winter time is a great time to pick up boats that has fiberglass structural repair that needs done, okay? You, during the winter, you work on your boat. In the summertime, to make a profit, you sell the boat repaired, finished. No more squishy floors, no more bad transom, and then you can get more double, triple what you paid for the boat because now you've got a solid boat and that's what a lot of people look for uh, when they're buying a boat as they walk around on the floorboard. If it's squishy, there's lots of uh, wood rot. So if you take pictures and videos of the build, you're gonna have a really good solid boat to sell in the summertime, springtime, when everyone's ready to get out on the lake, okay? So to me, uh, I'm a hobbyist, but I'm very professional and I know exactly how to execute fiberglass in a way to where when you're done, you get a professional product. Am I a boat build professional? No. This channel is strictly a hobby. Uh, this boat build number one is gonna teach you some great skills on how to do fiberglass and how to get it done properly, okay? There's a lot of YouTube channels out there and I'm not picking on anybody. Uh, a lot of people are cutting the back of the boat on the outside and then removing the rot and then uh, basically epoxy gluing <laughs> this piece back in, that will fail. Uh, you're gonna start seeing stress cracks around where you cut. If at any cost, don't ever cut the back outside edge of any boat. Um, we might do something on this boat, it has never been seen before, but I'm gonna wait. I need to get inside and see what I'm up against. I think I have a fuel tank in the back rear corners. If that's the case, then I can't do what I wanna do. If there's no fuel and those are just uh, foam pods in the back, then uh, we're gonna do something really awesome. And I'm gonna show you guys how to make the proper ribs, how to make the proper structure, and then we're gonna end up coming over the top and then we'll do our gel coat. And you're doing gel coat in reverse because you're building from the bottom out instead of like a mold where you're building from the outside in, okay? So in a factory, if you don't know this, they take their molds that look just like a finished boat, but they're the plug, they're the inside. So when they start, they wax it. When they're done waxing it, that is your release agent. That is necessary. If you didn't put a release agent, you would never get the gel coated out of there. And if you did, it would be chipped and ruined and cracked. So you want a release agent. Then you're gonna lay down your clear gel coat, okay? You're laying that on that waxed surface. And then after that, you're gonna add your flakes, stripes, color variations, 
you know, you could spend a week doing different color variations in flake, okay? There's multiple videos out there that show how boat hulls are made, okay? And then once you get your flakes and your stripes finished, then you're gonna back it with a base color. Most base colors are white or black, okay? You can base it with whatever. Like if I was gonna do a chrome flake with a green flake stripe, and then uh, say a, a bright lime green uh, stripe, I would base that entire boat in the lime green after all the flakes and stripes are done because if there's ever any spot where the flake is standing up and there's a hole, and I'm talking a microscopic hole, guys, if a flake was this big, imagine if a hole beside it was half its size, I wouldn't want to see black in that hole. Most of the boat's green and chrome, so I want to base that in that green. So. So then you lay down your base, and then after the base, then they lay down their matting, their mesh, and then over the top of that, they build their structure, and then when they pop the bottom of the boat out, it's like brand new. And then the wax just wipes, washes off, okay? And then they polish, and then you've got a finished product, okay? All right, so uh, I have in my notes that uh, partial builds, I have done more than 10. A partial build is just a transom or just a deck or just a floorboard or a damaged area, okay? I had someone who uh, they got rear-ended and then it cracked the corner of their boat. So I just repaired the corner of the boat, the corner of the side of the boat, and then inside we did a little structural repair where it didn't really hurt it, but it, just for safe measure, we ended up putting in a corner piece and uh, we glassed over that and everything just in case there was any weakness there that was from the car hitting the boat. Okay, and then as far as uh, simple builds, literally over 30 boats. Uh, simple is like a little bit of fiberglass repair and some carpet, okay? Or uh, put a brand new trolling motor or let's put some new meters and fish finders, okay? That's a good thing. Your old uh, fish finder pucks from the 90s and 2000s, used to just glue to the bottom of the transom. Well, when you go to the new technology and everything's on the trolling motor and everything's out the back of the boat, I like to remove the old stuff out of the boat. And when you do, sometimes there's a hole, sometimes there's an indention, or sometimes when you pull the puck, it'll pull the glass with it. You wanna do, do a small fiberglass repair. So there's even small stuff like that. Um, on the Viper, when we pulled the rod lockers, there was four or five bolts that were regular steel and they were rusted so bad, we had to pull them through the glass. Well, I will go back and uh, reinforce the back with matting. We will do multiple layers of fiberglass and then drill brand new holes. So when we screw in the stainless screws this time to hold the rod locker lids, uh, they'll have brand new fresh holes to go into. So as far as like simple stuff like that, I've done over 30 boats. Okay, question number three is, what are your goals for the boats you build? Okay, so my answer is, I plan on fishing the 21 foot Viper boat that we're building right now on the channel. We are going to pay for and fish all events for the 2024 Bassmaster Opens, okay? So the boat we're building um, is gonna have brand new sea deck, it's gonna have a brand new outboard, uh, it's gonna have uh, your power poles or talons, um, it'll have all the brand new electronics, all brand new batteries. Uh, we're going through the wiring completely. Basically, we're taking an old hull, we're making it super strong, and we're putting all brand new equipment on the boat. So essentially, you have a brand new boat on an old hull, but the old hull has been advanced and put into uh, a strength category that would be equal to a brand new boat. So the reason for that is, I don't have $100,000 laying around to buy a brand new boat. Uh, it's still gonna be expensive, let's face it. Um, after the electronics, the battery systems, the trolling motor, and the outboard engine, we're gonna be out $50,000 at least, at a minimum, okay? That stuff is expensive. Just your meters alone, when you run two in the back, say three in the front, and you're running your Garmin, okay? You do live scope and you do the trolling motor to go with it, and all those meters, you're already at fifteen to $25,000, depending on which size you go with. And then a brand new engine, okay, runs 
you can find sometimes a deal for 18,000 on up to 25,000, 30,000, okay? Depending on what you go with. Uh, you get your hydraulic jack plate, you know, you're talking thousands of dollars. Your talons or your power poles, you're in the thousands of dollars. So just the equipment, and we're not talking gauges, controls, um, hydraulic steering. I mean, once we add this up, we'll be out more than $50,000 on the accessories that go on the boat. Okay, we're also adding another axle to the trailer. We're gonna make it a tandem axle because the new motors are super heavy. Everything else we're putting on the boat is making it heavier and I don't want a single axle trailer for a 21 foot boat. It just, I've never understood the concept of that and I never will. So it needs another axle and we're gonna mount that axle behind the other axle and then, so the two wheels would be mostly in the back of the boat. And that's where all the weight is. That's where all the weight is. The big motor on there, you know, your talons or your power poles and your batteries, everything's in the back of that boat. So the boats we build after the Viper, okay? I've talked with everybody who's been involved as far as sponsoring, things like that so far. And what I want to do is on the next boat build we do, if we hit 100,000 subscribers, I'm going to give away the next boat we build after the Viper. Now, the Viper will serve its purpose for two to three years as my tournament boat, unless I win a big check, which is pretty slim chances. If I ever win a big tournament, then at that point, I will order a brand new bullet boat from Knoxville. Um, I'm gonna be absolutely going up there for a tour of the factory on Thursday the day before the Bassmaster Classic. So if any of you out there are interested, like let's meet up in Knoxville, let's go to the Bullet Boat, let's take a tour, let's go see what it's about because uh, the Bullet Boat is what I will be running. We will keep the Viper Boat forever. The Viper Boat is the one that got us our start. The Viper Boat is our, our legacy back into the tournament trail. And uh, I think it's gonna be really neat to see that old boat with all the brand new stuff on it. It's kind of like a resto mod when you take an older, you know, Camaro or Dodge Challenger or something and you take all the new car stuff and put it in it. You know, it's the same thing. I want to take this old boat because the floor plan is amazing and I want to take it and put all the brand new electronics, all the brand new motor. Like, it'll be a brand new boat because let's face it, the glass will be all redone, the C deck's brand new, all the wiring's brand new, everything else on the boat. Live well, aerators, bilge pumps, all that's gonna be brand new, all new switches. There won't be an old part on that boat except for the body itself and the rod locker doors. You know, the old steering wheel I'm gonna keep. You know, uh, you guys saw that we printed the, the Viper behind the JFL logo and then on the bottom says Viper. It was missing the horn button, so I made it on the 3D printer, the same one we build the, uh, all the lures behind me. All these are built on the same printer. And then of course now we've got the new glide baits. So anyway, let's get on to question number four. Question number four, how long does it usually take to complete a boat build realistically? If you were to dedicate 40 hours a week, every week, um, you could realistically do a boat in 90 days and uh, a boat like the Viper. So the Viper needs everything. The Viper needs the transom, the Viper needs floors, the Viper needs the front deck, and then we're stripping all the carpet. We're tearing out all the electronics. We're tearing out all the old wiring and all brand new stuff, okay? Uh, that's also gonna do a lot of weight reduction. We're gonna run the brand new lightweight batteries. We're gonna do a four bank system, charging system. We're gonna run the minimum amount of wiring for uh, your, all the electronics up to the front. Uh, in 90 days, you could complete a boat. And that's, that's not 90 work days, that's three months. So basically, you know, 20 days a month, 40 hours a week, you could realistically finish a boat like this if funds were available, okay? Uh, we're going as we can. I want this to be the people's boat. I want people to donate parts. I don't want any cash. We want people to donate parts. So I'm gonna have a parts list on the next episode. We're gonna get us a whiteboard. I'm gonna show you which parts we're gonna need for the boat in the future. And then I will offer people uh, the opportunity, like I said in the last video, uh, I don't care if you own a roofing company or you own a concrete company or rock company or gardening, whatever, a restaurant. Uh, we just want parts for the boat. If you buy parts for the boat, you get sponsored on the boat on the wrap. So we're gonna wrap the boat and we're also gonna wrap the tow rig. So, okay, number five. What fiberglass resin do you use? Awesome. 
Okay, great question. The best answer is you can go right down to your auto parts store, Home Depot or Lowe's and buy the 3M brand, Bondo. It's just regular fiberglass resin. It cures in two hours ready to sand, okay? Uh, we're not doing any laminating and you can, as long as you scuff the surface before you add new resin or if you want to add resin when the other resin hasn't fully cured you can do that and it will adhere to itself like i said resin is the easiest material to work with as long as let's say i put resin down right now and in 10 minutes it's sticky you could put your fingernail or fingerprint in it you can go right over the top of that right away uh, but make sure you're putting the same amount of hardener in every batch. If you do the bottom batch soft and the top batch is hot, and what I mean by hot is too much hardener will make it cure faster. If your top is curing faster than the bottom, that top's gonna crack. And it's gonna cause the bottom to delaminate. It's gonna pull it away from the surface. So you wanna make sure that every time you mix and you're using those 3M or um, Sherwin-Williams has them, uh, Home Depot has them. They're the plastic one quart cups. Those are the best thing to mix resin in. Um, if you mix it too hot, it'll melt the cup. If you mix it really too hot, it'll catch on fire. So be very careful, read the instructions, make sure you're putting the correct amount of hardener in your resin because you don't want an accident and you don't want no fires. Let's just put it that way. All right, let's, moving on to question number six. How long have you been fishing bass tournaments? <laughs> So I've been fishing bass tournaments since 1982. Uh, on a hobby level in 1992, uh, at the age of 16, I was accepted as a non-boater on the Red Man series. I had to get signatures from 10 boaters, but I had so much experience before and people knew it that had fished the Red Man that they allowed me, because you were supposed to be 18 years old to fish as a non-boater. I think I started when I was 15. I think I was 15 years old and had to get a signature from 10 boaters that was saying that I was allowed to be in the boats because I was able to fish well. You know, the last thing that the pro wanted on the Red Man series was someone who was getting snagged or didn't know what they were doing. So, but yeah, it was really cool. I got permission and I, I had 30 people that would sign a paper because I've been fishing tournaments, you know, since I was, I won my first tournament with my dad when I was seven years old on Lake Comanche and Hal Huggins was doing the tournament. There's some, there's some names for you. Hal Huggins. That's the first tournament I won with my dad on Comanche Lake in California. All right. Um, then uh, when I was 22, I joined my first bass club and it was called Shasta Cascade Bass Anglers and they're in Redding, California. And we fished Shasta, we fished Clear Lake, we fished Berryessa, we fished the Delta. I mean, we, we fished as much as we could in the state of California. Um, non voter of the year, both of the two years consecutively, when I was a Bass Club member. Um, shortly after that, I was, you know, I went out and bought a Ranger boat. Yeah, so my first Ranger boat I owned when I was 26 years old. I bought a 363V and it was trashed and I redid the carpet, I polished it. Um, it ran great, it was the first oil injected Merc. It had the brown and tan stripes on the motor, cowling. Uh, th that's how they came from Mercury. I just started fishing little tournaments and. We lived eight minutes from Lake Shasta. So I'd fish Lake Shasta every single weekend, whether I was tournament fishing or just regular fishing. George Dickel tournaments, one bass tournaments, uh, Western bass tournaments. Realistically, two to 300 tournaments, maybe 500 tournaments. So, I mean, I've been fishing tournaments since I was a little kid. You know, that's all my dad did. We did the body shop during the week and my dad went fishing on the weekends. My dad has, had a 1979 Ranger, you know, uh, 168V. It was an old D. Thomas boat. And uh, we were really good friends with D. Thomas. We used to go to his house and have dinner. And uh, it was a red, and it was called Big Red. And it was a 17 foot with a 150 with a chopper, 20, 21 inch chopper prop. And the boat run like 62 miles an hour. Back then, that was a fast, fast, fast boat. And if anybody knows a Ranger 168V, it has a flat bottom. They didn't have the V-bottom then, it had a flat bottom, and that boat would straight scoot. And there was no jack plates back then, uh, but it was a really fast little boat, and uh, we fished. If you look on my justfishlers.com, there's pictures of that boat. And uh, we fished that boat for 10, 12, 13 years, till 19, let me see, 1992, 
my dad ordered a brand new Ranger 392V from uh, California Custom Marines in Redding, California, and he got to order the colors. He ordered in Carmine Red and Starburst Chrome sides, and uh, that boat had a 200 Merc on it, and that boat would go 68, 69, 70 miles an hour all day long, and it was a dual council. It was called Big Red 2. He ordered it from Ranger through California Custom Marines, and uh, by that time, I had another Ranger bass boat. So to continue on that, then in uh, 2008, I was playing fantasy fishing for uh, FLW Outdoors, and I was doing pretty good, and uh, I needed and wanted a vacation. So I went out to Detroit in uh, 2008 to watch the Chevy Open uh, on the Detroit River, across from the Cobo Center at the Red Lion Inn. I don't know what it is now, but I rode a bus from the hotel down to Elizabeth Park for three days straight, and I was just in awe. You know, I was doing really good, and um, I just really loved bass fishing, and I had saved enough money to where I was thinking about fishing the FLW Tour as a co-angler, just so I could meet everybody and do this, and, and I didn't have a boat at that time. I was in between boats, so, I went out there and I just had a blast. I met everybody. I was really excited, super happy with the, the people there. And then um, I went back home and I had just bass fever. So I paid for all uh, six events and um, I fished the first tournament, the second tournament. I think the third tournament was Table Rock Lake and I was it was freezing cold. It was like 17 degrees. 12 degrees in the morning and uh, my second day draw was Clay Dyer and it changed my life. For those of you who don't know who Clay Dyer is, Clay Dyer is the most inspirational bass fisherman on the planet and uh, it was at that point my whole fishing career changed completely. So the next stop was Beaver Lake, Arkansas. When you're feeling down about yourself or you're feeling like bad things happen to you or why can't why can't you get a win, forget that. Go fishing with Clay Dyer. Watch a video of Clay Dyer. And the next tournament was Beaver Lake and I won $40,000 because my whole perspective on bass fishing changed that day. And then uh, shortly after that, we fished Kentucky Lake. I got a good finish there. I fished a pro side by then. So after I won the 40,000, I bought a Ranger 521 DVX. And it's a 2004. That's my last boat that I had before the Cobra. And then uh, I had a 250 Yamaha VMAX on it. Uh, that boat was fast. Uh, I went down to Kentucky Lake two weeks after we had our tournament there. And uh, I actually was leading the tournament with 18, 18 something. And then uh, the last two flights came in and I think I ended up eighth place, but it was still a good finish. I got a check for 700 and something dollars. So within the two month period, I had made almost $42,000 in my career. And then uh, the tournament after Kentucky, uh, I didn't do too good. So I signed up for the second season uh, for the 2010 FLW Tour. And on my second stop, we were in North Carolina and I get the, the phone call to go home. Uh, so I exited my professional career. We're back. And I moved back out to Alabama, June of 2020 when all the COVID stuff hit. They shut down California, they had a five o'clock curfew, and I decided I'm going to Alabama and I'm staying there. So Alabama is now home. I am focusing, those of you that watch my TikTok, I started a fish lure company, justfishlures.com, March 22nd, 2022. So this year I started justfishlures.com. We started with the soft plastics. I uh, designed 15 lures. We have 11 active lures on the site now. I phased out four lures that just weren't selling and honestly weren't catching any fish. These lures behind me actually catch fish. Two months ago, I decided to jump into the glide bait world. I designed my own glide bait, which is the ambush, which is what you see here. And then the predator is my 13 inch, this is the 13 inch glide bait, and that's a nine and a half inch uh, gizzard chat. 
And that's where we are now. Question number seven was, do you sell merch? Right now, I just finished designing my merch, but it's not available yet, but it will be available after the first of the year. And uh, right now we're just starting with the JFL logo and it's got like the silhouette of the lures behind me. Don't have a glide bait uh, shirt. This is the only glide bait shirt I got. But anyway, I just ordered these and I got my Cal Angler Championship on my chest here and in my name. And then I've got, I'm a member of Bass and I wanna fish the Bass events. So put Bass on there and then this is my TikTok. My TikTok is at Just Fish Lures. So I've got, uh, I think almost 36,000 followers. I need, I need to keep growing. And then, uh, you know, we just have the new company logo with the hooks on the J and the L. And then uh, I've got this and then the back has my name and it has the uh, predator on the back. And then we put the justfishers.com on the collar. I like this because I've got the JFL on the, on the collar as well. And uh, that's the new shirts. And I'm just trying to get the tackle company off the ground. So I want to roll with just JFL. Do I have the old sponsors? I can get them. I'm waiting to see who steps up for the JFL boat build. If we can get some good sponsors on the JFL boat build, I don't mind making a brand new shirt with those sponsors. And everybody knows that I represent my sponsors very well. I show up to every event. Uh, when I'm not bass fishing, I can show up to every event. I'm a very highly dedicated pro bass fisherman. So um, I'm a good guy to have on your team if you need your product out uh, in the spotlight. Okay, number eight. What advice would you give when mixing resin and hardener? Make sure you read the instructions. You wanna make sure that you do the same mix every time for one. When you're working on the same project, you wanna make sure that you use the same. So if you're using two ounces of resin and 20 drops of the hardener, and that don't quote me on that, I'm just saying, follow your instructions. It'll tell you exactly how much hardener to add to your resin. Just make sure you do the same every time and follow the instructions. Don't try to be a hero. Don't try to add more hardener to make it faster because you're running out of time. You will ultimately fail if you do that. Everything has instructions for a reason because if you mix it not enough, okay, that resin is never gonna cure to the end of time. If you mix it too hot, that stuff's gonna get brittle and crack and it's gonna have zero structural integrity. So you wanna make sure that you have the instructions down to a T and you wanna make sure you add the correct amount of resin to the correct amount of hardener. Number nine, what type of Fiber do you use, okay? I assume you mean fiberglass. So, uh, I use a lot of chop strand. Uh, chop strand can be also be cut up and used uh, to make like a emulsion paste. If you chop it fine enough, smoothie blender, you can throw chop strand in there and throw that in there and it'll chop it up super fine. And then you mix it in your resin, it makes like a paste. And then, uh, but before I mix that, I measure how much resin I'm mixing that paste with because when you do your hardener, you wanna go by the liquid volume that you put in that cup before you put the chop strand chopped up in it. But you don't put the hardener in until after the chop strand is mixed in good. But my point is you're not adding, say you put enough chop strand where you've got four ounces of paste, but you started with two ounces of liquid, okay? You don't wanna put hardener in for four ounces because the chop strand isn't hardening, just the resin is. So very important, listen to what I say. If you have two ounces of liquid, after you mix two ounces of chop strand, say you have four ounces in a cup, you're not putting hardener for four ounces. You're putting a hardener for the two ounces of liquid resin. You can use heavy mesh, finer stuff. I use mesh when I'm putting in a stringer. I use mesh when I'm connecting a stringer to the transom. Uh, I use mesh when I'm trying to reinforce, like you're gonna see on this uh, JFL boat build on the Viper is where the ladder is. We're gonna reinforce that with CUSA board uh, which will be quarter inch CUSA board. We're gonna add mesh and then chop strand and then mesh and then chop strand. Uh, but that whole corner of that boat will be really strong because when I climb on it, I'm 290 pounds. When I climb on it, that ladder's not gonna move. Uh, the last thing you want is that ladder moving, causing stress cracks and everything. So we're gonna reinforce that whole corner underneath where the ladder is and then the other corner is gonna get something special and we're saving that for a, another time. So anyway. Okay, let's move on. Question number 10 was, what do you use for cleaning tools and etc.? Okay, out here in Alabama, you can buy a five gallon of lacquer thinner for 40 bucks. Anyway, lacquer thinner is a good thing to keep your tools in, and I'm talking about metal tools. Metal rollers, metal knives, metal chisels, metal hammers, you keep it in uh, lacquer thinner. Uh, if you have a parts washer for cleaning spray guns, that's the perfect spot to throw your lacquer thinner in, throw all your tools in it, and then turn it on, 
and it sprays lacquer thinner all over. A second I would use is acetone. Acetone though, you have to be very careful. Um, acetone ruins plexiglass, acetone ruins some surfaces, acetone will strip paint off of things, acetone will uh, make rubber grow and plier handles fall off. I would just dip it in there, wipe it off with a rag and take the pliers out. The acetone makes it expand. The third thing I would use is isopropyl alcohol, 91% or better. Isopropyl on my hands instead of acetone or lacquer thinner seems to be a little nicer on the hands uh, if you get it on you. You should be wearing gloves. So always, you don't want that resin to contact your skin. It's, let's face it, it's a harmful liquid and it's not meant to be on your skin. Not to mention it's super messy. Number 11, what do you use to prepare a surface to start your fiberglass areas? I use grinders with heavy grit. 36 grit, 40 grit, any area where you're gonna be laying mat or chop strand, you wanna make sure that you've got it cut out, grooved pretty good. And a lot of people say, oh, there's so much cracks and crevices in fiberglass that it'll stick in there. Don't rely on that. You gotta remember is when resin cures, it cures round, okay? It puts a coating on there, okay? So it's smooth. Yes, it may have little dips and cracks and crevices, but even in those cracks and crevices, if you think about it, it was liquid when it was, when it was wet, before it was cured. So yeah, it may have made a crevice, but that crevice is still round and smooth everywhere. Number 12, do you work on other people's boats? The answer is not right now. I'm busy for the whole 2023 season trying to get my tackle store off the ground. Um, I want that to run so efficiently that it will pay for uh, my 2024 Bassmaster season on the opens. I can if they are ready to pay me to do the repairs. A lot of the problems is the boats that need the type of repairs that I do are usually boats that are 20, 25, 30, 35 years old. Um, sometimes the amount of the repair will exceed the value of the boat. In some people's cases, they don't care. Um, in our case on the 21 foot Viper, I don't care how much money we put into the boat because when we're done, it's a brand new boat and I'll have half the money that it would cost me to buy a brand new one. So to answer your question, yes, if the money was right, I could plausibly work on somebody else's boat. Uh, if somebody absolutely needs emergency transom repair, emergency fiberglass repair to make their boat water worthy, you just have to be prepared to pay the emergency price. So can I fit something in? Can I squeeze something in for the right money? Absolutely. Okay, number 13. What are you going to do on the top cap stripe to get rid of those cracks? Okay, very simple. Uh, let me tell you first why those are there, okay? Uh, when a boat cap is made, okay, in order to get the metal flake, which on that boat is charcoal silver, and then they have the red pinstripe, which is metal flake also, and then they have the black gel coat, but prior to the black gel coat going down, uh, you have a clear gel coat with a tiny bit of red twinkle in it. So for like a five inch by five inch section, you have maybe five or six flakes, okay? All right, so picture this. Everything's done in reverse when you're building a boat. So they lay it down, they wax the mold, then they lay down your clear and another coat of clear, and that's your top coat when you pop that out of the mold. Now picture this. In order to get the little red flake in there, they had to spray a tiny amount of red flake in the clear gel coat. So when you do that, that's gonna be right there in that section, okay? Now, in order to tape your stripe, your deck stripe, and your pin stripe that has to completely set up and dry now when that does that now they're gonna add probably the red stripe and then mask off for the platinum or what you want to call it's a charcoal chrome is what I call it so that may be 12 hours 24 hours 48 hours so now that last piece that top deck stripe that's been masked off for a day or two it has totally kind of cured it's not soft um, there's nothing that can keep the base coat so so your base coat, the final color going in that mold, after all the all the metal flake, all of the striping, and all of that stuff, it might be 48 hours till they can put that black gel coat base coat on those colors. Now that when they peeled the tape to lay down that black stripe, it's you're seeing the mold underneath because all they sprayed on there was the clear gel coat with a little bit of flake. So when they unmask that, now they're gonna coat the whole inside of that hull black gel coat on that particular boat. Now that I have explained why the cracks appeared on the boat let me explain how we're gonna fix it okay on the top of the cap boat you have your platinum silver color charcoal gray metal flake whatever you want to call it 
and then you have a thin black stripe and you have a thin red metal flake stripe and then the black gel coat with a couple twinkles of red metal flake in it. So what we're going to do is we're going to run two layers of Gorilla duct tape on top of each other right up past the red pinstripe. So you're going to cover the red pinstripe and the silver platinum metal flake and then you're just going to leave the edge of the black gel coat where it's cracked across the top of the cap. Same on the other side. So when you get done, you're going to have two strips of duct tape, double layered, and then you're just going to have the black gel coat revealed. Then we're going to take a block, it's called the Dura block. it's a black foam, hard foam block used for, the Dura block is used in automotive block sanding when you're doing body work. We're going to use it on the top cap of the boat. We're going to sand the gel coat down with 36 grit sandpaper so we can get all of those cracks out of that clear. I noticed that the cracks only go through the clear and they don't go down through the black gel coat. So that tells me that the clear itself is the issue. So once we sand through that, you're going to have like, if you were to magnify it, you'd have a dugout like a trench beside the duct tape. The duct tape gives you a guide to work your block sandpaper and you're going to do that along the whole top of the boat where the cracks are. And it's labor intensive but it's going to take probably a good two days to get it down the right where it belongs. And then from there we do the clean up, we blow the boat off, pull the masking tape off there which is your duct tape. Make sure you clean any glue residue and you're going to use acetone to clean the whole top cap of the boat. At this time you're going to go and you're going to hand sand with uh, let's say 220. You're going to hand sand with 220, not heavily because you don't want to break through that clear coat on the platinum silver or the red pinstripe. But you want enough to where that whole top cap is now uh, sanded completely. Because once we build up, we're going to do one coat of black gel coat. So you're going to, after you get it all sanded and cleaned off, you're going to run masking tape up to that red pinstripe again. You're going to leave the black gel coat that you sanded with 36 grit. Okay? And then, so all you're going to have, you're going to have the rest of the boat masked off and it's just going to be that little strip on the top cap. You're going to lay down one coat of the gel coat black. Then you're going to wait 25-30 uh, minutes for it to set. Then you're going to come back there with um, one thin coat of the clear gel coat with red sparkles in it. So I want in a 5x5 five five section I would like to have like 20 red flakes. So you're just going to mix like a quarter of a teaspoon of red flake in a full quart of your gel coat. Okay. So what you'll do is you'll get one thin coat of that clear over the black and then you're going to follow that with a heavy coat of clear gel coat and then you're going to stop. So before you put your last clear coat, then you're going to peel off all of your masking tape very carefully. And then what that's going to do is it's going to leave the whole top cap revealed. So you're going to see your hole and you can break the edge right there before it runs over into the interior. You can break that edge right on the round part of that lip before it goes in the interior. And then you're going to clear coat from that a little bit of the round, I'd say in the middle of the round, you know where it makes a curve like this? You're going to put your tape line on the middle of that. I call it the partial circle there, the lip. And then you're going to run that clear all the way past your rub rail line. Okay, because your rub rail is not going to be on the boat this time. So your clear is going to go up under the rub rail. So your whole top cap from the interior up over the top and down the side of the round on the top cap. So you're effectively redoing the entire cap, okay? And so that last coat of gel coat can be super thick. And the reason for that is you want enough to sand it smooth to get a glossy finish. So when you, I let that dry for a couple days and then let it sit out in the sun. And then I come back and I start sanding and I start with uh, 180, move up to 220, then move up to 320. Then up to 500, 800, 1200, 1500, 2000, 3000, then I polish it. When you get done, the top of the boat will be brand new, completely brand new. So that's the process. And that's it for our questions, guys. Um, I'm your host, Brent Bridgman, and I run the JFL Boat Build Series. And I'm so glad that you guys are here. Hopefully, today's show was a little different, but hopefully, you gained some knowledge and some confidence. And I really appreciate if you guys would smash the like, hit the subscribe button. Please share this with all of your people. Tight lines, catch some giant fish this year. Let's utilize the big old giant glide baits that I make now. Um, these will be painted and ready by January 1st. 
Um, there was a small hiccup with the weather and an air compressor and stuff like that, but we're ready to go. Um, all my soft baits are available at justfishlures.com. If you want, you can jump over onto my TikTok, and that is at justfishlures. Thank you for joining me today. It's been great, and we will catch you next Friday. Sponsored today by JustFishLures.com. Please subscribe, hit the like, and turn on that bell. As always, thank you for supporting the channel. We'll see you next Friday.